And we're getting close to uh, the triumphal entry, which I don't know if I'll make it for that Sunday, which is a couple weeks away. I don't, it doesn't look real pos positive for that, but um, it would be like, oh, we're right on schedule, except that the resurrection doesn't come for like four chapters later. Or the, so it's, it's not like you know, I'll be able to, I'll have to take it out of order uh, as we move into it. But we are in a section that he's been preparing his disciples for uh, not only his leaving, in, but also for the kingdom that will come in the future. Uh, because he would be leaving, and he knew that. He's been telling them already that uh, he's going to die and be resurrected, and, and uh, they, they can't understand that. Uh, in fact, right after the passage we're going to look at today, he gives a third time announcing that he would be going to Jerusalem and, and die and be resurrected. And so they're like, what's, what's going to happen to us? And so he's been preparing for his departure, but he's also preparing them for the kingdom that he is uh, coming back to establish because as the Son of Man, that was, that's his destiny. Uh, if you remember in Daniel, the Son of Man is the, 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 the one man that's going to come and establish the kingdom on earth. And that could never be a, a man that had the sin nature. It had to be a man that did not, was not complicated by the sin nature that we got from the first Adam. And Jesus is the second Adam, the Christ. And he is going to uh, come as, and eventually uh, to establish that kingdom on earth that was promised all the way back in the, in the creation story. So um, last week we saw that uh, he's now trying to get him ready for the kingdom. And uh, develop, by developing the spiritual walk with the Lord, it, we can, it can lead to readiness for the kingdom. And we, we talked about depending on God, drawing near to God, and determining to serve God without the thought of rank or title. And so uh, today it kind of flows into that. It, doesn't, it could be part two almost, and you see the title is Inheriting Eternal Life. When you think of an inheritance, um, you think, oh goody. <laughs> Because I'm going to get something, right? Why wouldn't you think that? If an inheritance, though, is based on a relationship you have with somebody, you don't get an inheritance just because some rich person or something that someone who has a wealth dies. You get inheritance because you may know that person really close, whether it be a relative, whether it be a close friend, whether it be a faithful servant. Uh, that person in their will wills certain things in their inheritance uh, to uh, the people that they consider uh, worthy of that inheritance. Um, and it's, the inheritance then is a, is a possession. It, 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 the ownership is passed from the deceased to whoever they want to have that. That's what an inheritance is. Uh, and that's true even when we're talking about uh, eternal life. This is not about becoming saved eternally in the sense that we usually talk about that you have faith in Christ and now you have have eternal life that is not the same as inheriting eternal life because inheritance is taking possession of that life whereas receiving it as John would talk about is receiving it as a gift and and that's that that has nothing to do with what you've done to, to be because uh, you're no longer you're, you're not even related to God to receive an inheritance but now as we're related to God through faith in Christ we're an heir according to uh, Galatians as in an heir we have the potential of inheriting something and that's what he's going to talk about here through the story of the rich young ruler uh the rich young ruler is known by all of us, and we probably heard it uh, preached on or taught many a times. And uh, as I got into looking at it again, there's probably 50 different ways of understanding it. And that may be uh, light on how many time, ways people do it. it, it it's, it's, it's in some ways controversial in the way that uh, people understand it. Um, I've always felt like in dealing with this story, uh, I've always been inconsistent. I've never felt comfortable explaining it. <laughs> Honest truth. 
uh, because it never felt like it really fit. Um, I've had to weigh a lot of the material here and uh, uh, come up with a way that I think fits. I've got help from some sources that, that help me in that thinking. And so I'm not going to present all the vast ways of people on how they take it. I'm pretty much presenting the way I see it, at least at this point in my development of understanding uh, this passage. Now, it, I think the main idea of the whole story is, is a faithful, committed disciple of Jesus will inherit eternal life. If you look at verse 18, that's the question. Now, a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? His question is one of inheritance. Now, if you go all the way back down to verse 30, which is the end of the, of the discussion of the young rich ruler, you see that Jesus is saying to his disciples, to Peter, basically, and then to the disciples, uh, who shall not receive many and more in this present day? In the age to come, eternal life. So in the age to come, the disciples will receive eternal life. Well, does that mean that they don't have it now? Here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's, here's a clue, really, when you look at the, uh, the concept of eternal life in Scripture. When it's talking about in eternal life as present, right now, that's a gift that you receive through faith in Christ. When it talks about it in the future, of something we're going to receive in the future, it's not a gift, it's a reward that one receives for faithfully serving the Lord. Because eternal life is not just a quantity of time, eternity, but it's also a quality of life. And so initially in the present, through faith in Christ, we are given eternal life in the quantity aspect that we now have eternal life. But that doesn't mean that we're experiencing that life the way we, we, we will in the future, uh, even right now. But we can, and Jesus says it can be an abundant life, and so it can be experienced that way now. But then in the future, the future, the age to come, the kingdom, can we experience that life in a, in a greater way? That's what's called inheriting the kingdom. Or, as he says, every, having it in the age to come. Now, I think the context helps us here as well. Remember uh, last week, we talked about the last story, Jesus blesses little children. In all three synoptic Gospels, you know what the synoptics are? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All right, Those are, the, those are called the synoptic Gospels. John is not called one of the synoptic Gospels because he kind of strays away from the, the chronolo chronological order that the, the, the other three are following. All right, so, so the three synoptic Gospels all have this story. On every one of them before the story of the rich young ruler has the story of the little children. And, 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 and what, again, what does this story have to do with? Well, I, I'll, I'll repeat what I said last week. Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. But surely I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And, and I said last week that in chapter 19, when he's talking about the mina, and he said in verse 15, and so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded his servants to, the, to, to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained uh, by trading. So the, the owner is coming back to receive the kingdom, which is talking about authority, ownership, possession, so in back, back to what the little children are saying is unless you assume a status of, of the lowest man on the totem pole, right? Unless you assume the lowest status of society, in other words, the first will be last and the last will be first. That's the idea. That's, that's a call to discipleship. And, and that's what I think this, the story of the rich young ruler is, a call to discipleship. In fact, right after the story of the rich young ruler, we have uh, the, the, the third uh, time that Jesus predicts his death and resurrection in all three synoptic Gospels. 
Because why? Because he is the prime example, the supreme example of someone who assumes a low status. In other words, that he gives his life up for others. And um, uh, following the, 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 the aspect of his death and resurrection, we come uh, to the minas, which is uh, uh, in chapter 19, which is about reward. In fact, in Mark and in Matthew and Mark, he talks about greatness in serving. Those who serve can be, will, will be great. In other words, it ends each, in fact, Matthew and Mark ends the story of uh, the rich young ruler saying, the, last, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. All this is to say that I see this, this story not as a, as, a, as a story about how someone becomes a believer in Christ, but how believers can become and uh, receive inheritance in the kingdom or inheritance of eternal life. You see the difference? The context is about that. So everything I'm going to say is geared toward that. We'll start with verse 18 and, and uh, 19. Now a certain... Ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one who's good but one that is God. And here the goodness of God, inheriting eternal life, is established on the goodness of God alone. Why would anybody be able to inherit? It's only because God in His goodness is, 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 is providing that possibility for people. God never had to do that. And you, and you think about God's goodness, you go, well, what do you mean it's goodness? Well, we have a song, right? They, everybody used to sing all the time. God is good in all the time, right? God is good in all the time. What does that mean? Look back at Exodus chapter 33. Because remember, Jesus is talking here to Jewish people that would have the background of the Old Testament about who God is. And so back in Exodus chapter 33, after uh, Moses is, is up uh, on the Mount Sinai to receive uh, the, the, the second set of tablets after the first were destroyed, um, in verse 18 and 19, because uh, he's, he's, Moses is asking God for a special favor. And Moses says in verse 18 of chapter 33, please show me your glory. Then God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will gracious to, to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Isn't it interesting? Moses says, show me your glory. And the first thing God says is, I will make my goodness pass before you. You, the first aspect you got to understand about God's glory is that, that He is, is His goodness. In fact, look in chapter 34 when it actually happens in uh, verse uh, 5 through 7. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before Him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abounding in goodness and truth keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. The Israelites knew that it was only by God's goodness that, that He had selected Abraham to be a special people. And only by God's goodness that He had selected a land for them to live in. And that was their inheritance. Because of God's goodness. But we know that the story is that not all the, the Israelites actually possessed the land. The, the Levites were not given possession of the land because of their unfaithfulness to their father. And Simeon also was not given real possession of the land because he was given possession of part of uh, Judah's land. So he became consumed, as it were, within the, the tribe of Judah. Uh, but they were all negated their possession of the land by their unfaithfulness to their father. So just because it was 
it, by God's goodness, it's available, doesn't mean that all the people that it's available to will actually take possession. But they understood in the, in the Old Testament that it was God's goodness. Look in uh, Psalms uh, chapter 34. Now, there's no way we can look at all the passages on the goodness or God being good. But just to get a, 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 an understanding of what the Old Testament is saying. And let me start reading in verse 1 it's of Psalm 34. Oh, bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. I sought the Lord and He heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to Him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear Him and delivers them. Oh, hate, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in Him. Oh, fear the Lord, you His saints. There is no want to those who fear Him. The, the, the young lions lack and suffer hungry, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. It's interesting that the Psalms, again, points out that God is good, and those who trust in Him benefit from that. One of my favorite Psalms, because I had to memorize it as a kid, is Psalm 100. And the last verse says, For the Lord is good, and His mercy endures forever. Right? And his, and his truth endures to all generations. That the Lord is good. They understood that who they were as a people and what God had provided for them as an inheritance was because of God's goodness. Now, there are several psalms that start off, verse 1, with praise the Lord, or give thanks to the Lord, for He is good and His mercy endures forever. There's one of the psalms that starts and ends that way. That's Psalm 118. So if you, if you look at Psalm 118, you can see the verse 1, it says, O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. And it goes through a litany of things that Israel has experienced because of God's goodness in their history. And it ends with verse 29. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. When the young uh, ruler, a uh, young wealthy person, was coming to ask Jesus, saying, uh, uh, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He understood, I'm pretty, I, I'm pretty sure, that he was asking Jesus about how do you inherit eternal life, because that is only, that's a good thing, right? That's, that's, a, that's a thing that, that you would uh, 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 ascribe to. But the, the point of it is, Jesus points him and says, only God is, the, is good in, in that sense. And to, call, to say that, that I'm a good is to say that I'm also God. So, if you're going to inherit eternal life, and God's the one that's the one that gives out of His goodness that, that eternal uh, life as an inheritance, and Jesus is also God, then what should he do to get eternal life? Follow Jesus. Which he's going to say later on. Verses 20 and 21. So Jesus uh, says to him, You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not false, uh, bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. Um, obviously, he didn't have any problems with arrogance. But, uh, <laughs> see, inheriting eternal life is earned by one's obedience of God's commands. Jesus isn't saying, oh, let me throw something in your way so that you, so that you can't get it. He's saying, you know, you understand the Old Testament. Look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30. This is the uh, uh, last um, encouragement uh, by Moses to the second generation of Israelites before they go into the promised land. 
The first generation lost out. So in verse 15 of chapter 30 of Deuteronomy, See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, and to keep His commandments, His statutes, and His judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go in to possess. See, this is going in to possess the land that God gave as an inheritance. And the only way they could really do that it was if they were obeying God's commandments. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the, in the land which you crossed over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey His voice, and that you may cling to Him, for He is your life and the length of your days, that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them. See, he's saying, basically, you understand that for you to inherit what God has promised, it takes obedience of what God has commanded. That's what the Israelites understood. And so this, this inheriting uh, uh, or earning the uh, eternal life, it's a greater experience of life. That's what Moses is saying in Deuteronomy. It's not just the physical living, but it's also the experience of that life and its blessings. That's what he was saying. So that you could go in and live and receive his blessings. Inheriting eternal life is earned by one's obedience of God's commands. Now this young man said, oh good, then I'm going to get it. I'm going to inherit it because I've done it. He thought he had it made. But Jesus had another twist for him in verse 22. And so when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Now we're talking about treasure. So inheriting eternal life is basically equal to having treasure in heaven. Why? Because of good works. It's interesting, he said, um, you lack one thing, and he didn't say faith. So many people want to throw that in here. He said, no, go sell all that you have and give to the poor. That's the one thing you lack. It's interesting that, that Matthew doesn't use the word one thing you lack like Mark and Luke does. It says that this that one thing to be perfect. And the word for perfect there, Tellius, is, is to be complete. It's, it's the idea of being mature. He says, the one thing that you lack for maturing as a disciple of mine is to do what? is to sell all you have and give to the poor. Now, is that anything different from what Jesus already said back in chapter uh, 14 of Luke when he's going through uh, the call to discipleship and the, and the, and the demands or the, uh, the commitment it takes to be a fully committed disciple? And he, and he says in verse 33, So likewise, whoever you does not follow, forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. That's what he's asking this one young person to do. He's asking this young person to, 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 to sell all that he has, to, to trust in God with his life by, by giving what he, he has to the poor. In other words, good works of benevolence to those who are in are greater need than him as, as a ministry that, 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 uh, 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 to Christ. He's not willing to do that. Which in essence, he didn't want to complete one final command. The last commandment of the Ten Commandments is do not covet. See, Jesus was mentioning the previous commandments in the Ten Commandments that dealt with your neighbor. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. In other words, do you love man? Remember the Ten Commandments? Loving God, loving man. Verse 4, loving God. Last 6, loving man. And he left 
the last one out, do not covet, because he, he, he understood, Jesus could understand, that this young man who was wanting to inherit eternal life by, 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 by obeying God had a problem. He trusted more in his wealth than he did really in God, in his daily life. And Jesus said, no. If you want to be mature as a follower, a mature follower of me, a, a disciple who's complete, then sell all you have and give to the poor and come follow me. Well, obviously, this man had a difficulty in verse 23, and when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was rich. So Jesus responds and says, when he saw that he become very, when Jesus saw that, he became very sorrowful, and he said, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. What most people do at this point and say, what Jesus had just told the young man prior was pre-evangelism, to try to jar him to come to faith. But I had a, always a hard time saying that because when, when Peter picks up on it, he, he goes, well, so we've left all and followed you. So Peter's not even responding to issues of faith. He's responding to issues of following. And as I said last week, that, that uh, we see this entering the kingdom as if it's a, 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 a entering into a gate, as it were, and now we're in. Whereas entering into the kingdom can also mean not only entering into a gate to be in, inside the, the gate, but also experiencing a, a greater life inside the kingdom and even greatness inside the kingdom can also be, be talked about you enter into something to experience it. And I think that's what he's saying here is that it, it, inheriting eternal life then for this young man was too exacting for those who trust in their, their earthly riches. In other words, he's saying, I can't follow you like that. I just, I just can't go that, the, the, those, that far. That's too much. You're asking too much. If that's what inheriting the, the eternal life is all about, then, then, then I can't do it. Interesting, Paul wrote in 1 Timothy, at the very end of the book, chapter 6 in 1 Timothy, verse 17 through 19. Now this is he's writing to believers. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give willingly to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold of, to possess, to inherit eternal life. See, I think that Timothy there is basically uh, restating what the message of the rich young ruler is all about. Is someone wanting to follow Christ? I remember uh, John Maxwell, and he speaks a lot on leadership, and I went to a conference he, that he gave and listened to him for quite a while. Many years I was uh, listening to John Maxwell on leadership, and I uh, heard him once say that, have you ever noticed that as you go up the ladder of, of leadership, it gets lonelier and lonelier. There's less and less people. He says, you know why that is? Because uh, further up on the ladder of leadership, the commitment is greater, and not as many people want to make that kind of commitment. And I think that's what Jesus is saying to the rich young ruler here is, to have to, have, to really inherit the eternal life that you're asking about, 
It's about a full-blown obedience. It's, it's not holding back. It's not being holding back in something in reserve like, oh, i got to keep this for myself. No, this is about really letting God have everything. Not that you have to go out and sell everything, but you can't hold it in your palm to say, that's what's going to keep me from following Christ. He was asked, that's what he was asking this guy. It's hard for believers to be all out fully committed to following Christ. And Jesus understands that because of our pressures we have in our world. <laughs> Especially monetarily. So in verse uh, 26, 27, then those who heard it then who can be saved? See, this isn't the group I told you before. This is a group of disciples that are ta we're talking about here. And Jesus said, these things are impossible with men, uh, with men are, are possible with God. And so we always, <clears throat> again, so many people say, well, that, no, he's talking about eternal salvation. No, I think he's talking about e inheriting eternal life. What do you mean? Because what is he saved from? What's this young man being saved from? Inheriting eternal life is only entered into because of God's work in the disciples' life. In other words, there's only, the only way that I as a believer in following Christ am ever going to attain the inheritance of eternal life, what God Jesus is talking about, and following Him full out is through the work of God in my life because I can't do it by myself. It's impossible for man to, to, to come to that kind of commitment all on his own, uh, okay? It is still a work of God in our life. And that's why Peter's like, well, we left all and followed you. What, what, what do we get? See, he understood what Jesus was dealing with here. And they had left all. Look what it says. And so he said to them, Surely I say to you that there's no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many thing, thing times more in this present age in the age to come eternal life. So inheriting eternal life is the enrichment of life in the age to come. <clears throat> Look at Matthew 19. It's interesting to see that how Jesus responds to Peter. Uh, Peter's question in, in Matthew 19 is, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? And Jesus said to them in verse 28, uh, Surely I say to you that in the, in, in, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of His glory, you, you who have followed Me will, have, will also sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. See, Jesus responds in Matthew by saying, hey, you're going to own, be owners. You're going to be rulers. You're going to be those who possess the eternal life in that regard. Not just have it, but really enjoy it. In fact, he uses the term in Matthew, the, the enjoyment of life or to enrich life. And as I said before, Matthew and Mark both said then the end that with the first will be last and the last will be first. I think Jesus is trying to teach his disciples through this young man that in inheriting eternal life is for those as believers who assume a servant role of sacrifice in this life so that they may be greatly rewarded in the kingdom to come. That's that's not hard. That's not easy. You see, Jesus has been repeating this this call to discipleship in Luke. You don't get something the first time. You don't get something second time, maybe a third time. But 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 you have a greater chance of getting it the more times you hear it. And when he ends by saying that uh, he's going to die again, they understand that, hey, there's not a whole lot of time 
and they don't really realize, I mean, they're, they're within a, a week probably of his death at this stage. There's not a lot of time with Jesus on the earth yet. And everything that they thought was going to happen with him there is, is, is going to be questioned. And what kind of commitment are they going to have then after he's gone? That's why he's trying to motivate them, encourage them, that whatever commitment they have in following Christ, you receive benefits now, but even more so, you receive a benefit in the kingdom with the future reward that's called inheriting eternal life. An enrichment of that life in the kingdom with rulership, with authority. Because someone has decided, I will be a servant and put themselves at that level just as a child so that Christ may exalt them in due time. What he's looking for is people to serve him that aren't looking for position. It's looking for servanthood or sacrifice. For obedience. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your words. We know that your words are powerful, more powerful than a two edged sword. So, Father, we just pray that you would uh, uh, help us to understand clearly, help us to. Uh, be committed to following those words, following Christ through those words. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.